I'm Yvonne Blomer and this is Beth Cope. Welcome to the third annual Forest Poetry Walk with the Victoria Festival of Authors. This year we are virtual with a podcast and webcast. We are also at Thetis Lake in Victoria. Four poets will share poems that speak to their own unique geographic diversity. From British Columbia, we have Arlene Perre. From the Yukon, Joanna Lilly. From Alberta, Jenna Butler. And in Nova Scotia, Annick McCaskill. Listen to their poetic insight and responses to land, water, and sky. Find solace when immersed in landscape and the deep connection we can make if we are here to listen. We'd like to thank the BCAC, Canada Council for the Arts, League of Canadian Poets, the CRD, City of Victoria, and the United Way. And this year, the festival programming was funded in part by the Government of Canada's Emergency Community Support Fund. We acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen and Wissanich peoples on whose traditional territory the Victoria Festival of Authors takes place. We acknowledge their welcome and that we can work, create, and celebrate here together. Let's introduce the poets. Jenna Butler is the author of the poetry collection Seldom Seen Road, Wells, and Aphelion, a collection of ecological essays, a profession of hope, Farming on the Edge of the Grizzly Trail, and the travelogue Magnetic North Sea Voyage to Svalbard. Reverie, A Year of Bees, Essays about Beekeeping, Climate Grief, and Trauma Recovery, is out with Wolfsack and Wynn this year. Butler is a professor at Red Deer College and farms off-grid in northern Alberta. Joanna Lilly is an award-winning poet living in Whitehorse. Born in the UK, Joanna has always been drawn north, crossing the Arctic Circle twice before settling in the Yukon. Her work has appeared in numerous literary journals, including the Malahat Review and Grain. Endings is her third collection of poetry. Annick McCaskill's poems have appeared in journals and anthologies across Canada and abroad, including ARC, Canadian Notes and Queries, and Best Canadian Poetry 2019. Her debut collection, No Meeting Without Body, was nominated for the Gerald Lampert Memorial Award and shortlisted for the J.M. Abraham Award. Her second full-length collection, Murmurations, was published by Gasparo this spring. She lives in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Arlene Carre is a Victoria writer. She has published five collections of poetry, two of which are cross-genre. She has been shortlisted for the BC Book Prize's Dorothy Livesey Poetry Award and has won a Golden Crown Award for Lesbian Poetry, the City of Victoria Butler Book Prize, and a Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry. This forest walk will take you through parts of Thetis Lake with pauses at bridges, along paths, in meadow, under the tree canopy, and at lake's edge. You will hear the poets read at the stops along the way. Hope you enjoy this virtual walk and find inspiration in your own corner of the world. I'm going to read the poem Michaelmas from my book Aphelion. It begins with an epigraph from the poet Dybrandt. Whatever there is in me that is singing, whatever there is in me, you are there too. Rain pelts down, nine o'clock in September, and you, five thousand miles away, across water. I trace droplets down double glaze, stark against miasma of street lamps. 
Perhaps where you are, it is bright and crisp, early winter, blue. You cannot feel the slap and glide of drizzle-damp wool, smell the heady fug of bonfires left unturned and smoldering, twists of oak leaves cindering slow, ponderous opalescent smoke. But I imagine you on the porch, attuned to the harping of coyotes out on the ice, Ululation moving through you, cool and tenuous as rain. This poem is from my latest collection called Earl Street. The poem itself is called The Question of Delight in the Maelstrom of the Sorrowing World. What chimera of yellow birds in flight could be more dizzying? These leaves that remain, small disks of sunlight. The wind blows and they shiver, shine. What about vertigo, the risk? The world in spill, upside down, unbalanced, reeling, as leaves peel off one by one. As we lean on the unstable air, we depend on our ears, on language to make life surpass what it will become, as we depend on failing leaves to shimmer with or without any sun. What about thrall, kaleidoscopic, small garments slipped, limbs undressed, turn into roots exposed to the cold? Late autumn rain, the cup still overspills. Hello, I'm Joanna Lilly, and I'm really pleased to be talking to you all the way from Whitehorse in the Yukon, where I'm standing in my garden, and I'm really honoured to be living here on the traditional territories of the Tahan Quachin Council and the Conlindan. First Nation, and I'm going to read a poem that's very much inspired by the Bubal Hartebeest, which uh, was an antelope living uh, north and south of the Sahara, and very sadly became extinct in about 1925 or so. And uh, when I was writing this, I was very much inspired by those moments we, we get if we're lucky, where we see uh, deer coming into uh, our habitats, and uh, we realise we're very much in their habitat as well. So this is called, I hold up my hands. Wrists together, palms open, angled, fingers lifted to make the shape of horns, a flower, now swiftly a chalice. You pour into the space I hold. I carry the air of you, the nothing you have become. My fingertips tickle with the scented recollection of high savanna grass. Magpies. Remarkable to our East Coast eyes, quotidian pest to the locals. You say beautiful and spark derision, their eyebrows raised like pinky fingers and the corners of their mouths twitching. Rare still to us, all these months later, as memory, relegated to our respective crevices of Canada. A pest, this distance, this longing. In memory, the bird's sleek feathers are still glossy in sunshine. Inky check marks against the whiteness of the sky, the mountains, their wings and tails iridescent, pulsing against the limits of spectrum, rippling our vision into mirage. You still say beautiful with conviction. The world won't know what to make of us either. This is called Flight. It's from the book Wells. Sometimes I get through the day solely because there are birds. Spring months, the sky clocking almost blue. 
Over the salt marshes, a linnet in aerobatic flight, its song peeling like rain. Transitory as the moon, whimrels on stilt legs, their fluted bills and panpipe call. April, and you have left me in every way but flesh. There are grasshopper warblers nesting in the old flint quarry, their namesake silver thrum flashing from the bracken. Sound of neurons misfiring, beyond language, the tone of the body leaving itself. Ventriloquial, wherever you are, be somewhere else. I have taken to walking in the mornings beyond sight of the sea, its endless heave of loss. The lane back of the sea road holds a different cast of characters, the regulars you loved best. Meadow pipit stalking spiders, buffeting each other upward in a mad, startled rush. In the hedgerows, coal tits, wheat ears, dunnocks shuffling like old men in the brambles. Near the common one summer, we stopped to watch cattle on the green. On the fence, two robins dashing at a startled jackdaw. The smallest things made you chuckle then, those robins, persimmon indignant. This brittle clock skitters into fall, sheaves piled and suddenly one morning dotted with bramblings, field fairs. Two evenings into October, I stop for a herd on the coast road and a night jar's call churs through the window. Such a strange sound, dry twig rattle, that knuckled clatter, the season turning over. Winter comes early and brings a skiff of snow, settles its long shank bones across the saltings. For days, few birds dare the windy stretch of beach. I turn the collar of your houndstooth jacket, already willing to trade gale winds for summer's pearl of tide. In the garden, frost binds the fire crust voiceless, the tree creepers knotted along branches, clicking their darning bills. At dusk, the barn owls drift soundless, gray and peat against the dark. They have stitched themselves along the rafters of the old hay barn near the common. At my entrance, the collective ruffle of feathers like indrawn breath, the flash of countless eyes before exhale and flight. The house empties with your presence, sound bleeding out at the edges. A missile thrush calls from the coal shed roof, and I see your eyes flare briefly before the inevitable blank. You saw, you saw a storm petrel, you told me once, out along the coast road. Nothing else it could be, you enthused, its feet skittering on the water as it dipped low to feed. The delight of it banked against my disbelief, your complete faith in that small, black-glossed bird. It couldn't have been. I wanted to say. They only come in gale-tossed and rarely off the North Sea. They make landfall to mate, and then only at night on the turning breeze. You don't see them coming, but you can hear them. A great, rolling, susurrus, like the evening-given voice. And in behind it, the sound of loss. Silence precipitating tangibly. The same sound leaking from this house. Night dip of a black wing. Hello again, it's Joanna Lilly here in Whitehorse in the Yukon, and I'm going to read you a poem about the lesser koa finch, a bird who lived in Hawaii, and it's about the joy of seeing birds in the trees, but unfortunately takes a little bit of a dark turn because it's about. Um, the two men, Palmer and Munro, who collected the first and the last specimen over a period of uh, two weeks uh, towards the end of 1891. And this is called Big Island. The finch is high in the koa tree. The two men see it and raise their field glasses. It's smaller, yellow, not green and large like the others. Same thick, dark, conical bill though, juvenile. Munro whispers. Palmer nods and lowers his monoculars. He lifts his shotgun to get a closer look. 
A hundred birds rise at the blast and scatter. The men watch the little one fall, listen for the landing. It takes a while to find it in the bright green grass. Munro picks it up. It's tiny in his upturned hand, shot ragged and blood speckled. Palmer spreads a cloth on the ground. Gently, Munro puts it down. Palmer unsheathes his knife. He holds a little bird with splayed fingers, cuts into its warm breast. Its stomach is crammed with coa pods. Greedy beggar, Palmer says, as blood settles in the creases of his knuckles. Munro dabs a stout finger into the spill. Caterpillars, I reckon, he says in the tight New Zealand accent Palmer loves. No wonder they grow up green, Palmer laughs. Our Lord and Master's going to like this. Munro raises a finger to his lips. Shh, he says, there's another one. Palmer raises his gun. Missed call. The house sparrow carries sunlight in her beak. Consider the mystery, the slight frame burgeoning with hymns against the backdrop of still melting snow, blue and white pooling in the long given out grass. Under cedars I walk and whisper, attempt forgetting, but her notes are pressed upon my mind. Her flesh moves over me, probes my body. I don't expand like she does, but I no longer split from wanting. Her call rushes my insides, sears my chest, tests my resilience. I try her song, but my throat fails, feeble. And would you hear me anyway? I imagine your arms in another version of winter, deep in snowdrifts, limbs and torso smudged in effort and evening. You catch everything as I see it, while I'm still here, rasping. But her notes envelop my mind's soft ear, her flesh. But her notes still surface in my mind, her flesh. But her notes are stamped upon my mind, her flesh. But her notes sink into my mind, her flesh but her notes become infixed in my mind, her flesh. For the Gary Oak in spring, your spiral spill, fork, twist, your gray encrypted trunk, your corkscrew tips, your branches ankylosing, whipped, wrong turns and rights, misses and mistakes, preconditions of your wit, two California quail in silk and black with curling tops quill your limbs. The hole fills up, crisscrossing blue and brimming, while the quail step down your blistered bark gather for teachings. What lifts you, leads you. Each branch's bend buckled against the one before inside your spacious net. Such precision, following less the light than your unresisted will, your art, your gibbous maze of soul. At the end of every branch, a fistlet, about to burst its velvet glove. Hello, it's Joanna Lilly here, and I'm going to read a poem called Dendrochronology. Now, I live in Whitehorse in the Yukon, where there are many, many trees, but they tend to be rather tall and lean and on the skinny side. Um, so I'm always amazed when I go south and I see the, the vast forests and broad trunks 
of the trees there. And this poem is inspired by the Douglas fir and an experience I had at uh, the Redpath Museum. Dendrochronology. At eye level, Charles I ascends the throne. It's 1625 on this gigantic slice of Douglas fir, propped against the wall like a tabletop, ready to be rolled away. An old man sits on the wide stairs, a boy beside him, watching as if they think they'll catch the wood still growing. Near the tree trunk's central split, Zhu Yuang Zhang ascended to the Chinese throne, the start of the orderly Ming dynasty. This Douglas fir was puny then, though already thicker than any mammal's limb. The close-up photograph the old man takes frames straight lines, like stacks of yellowed newspapers, not rings. This tree grew beyond its documentation in 1791, beyond its later naming in honour of a Scotsman dead in a bullpit in Hawaii. Each ring is not a coil of human progress. A tree can live and die without a single touch from an apex predator. Its only interactions can be with other species. It can be bat roost, squirrel dray, or big enough to bear a bald eagle's nest. Even when it dies and falls, it pupates into a habitat for beetles, slugs, and sharp-tailed snakes. That's why the old man and boy are watching. They want to know how to open the circle and step in. This next poem is from Lake of Two Mountains. Sun going down. Nine o'clock, the hour of the sun going down, listing to the south. The drowsing dark lake shushes itself on the shore, divinity lingering this way. Nine o'clock, the hour of fox on the move, hour of closing, the sky closing over, losing its hold. Fox stealing slow as the sun going down to the shore, looking for fish. Yarmouth County. A simple house, its windows elevated over Chibogue Point, the blonde panels rendered still paler in whitewash. Ducks drift in the river to where it seeds to marsh grasses, threaded through winter's last snow. And the geese rinse their necks, four base clefts dip beneath the sky's grayed mirror, emerge flickering with water and sunbeam, their new home temporary, though not without heft. Today the clouds will change color with every passing hour. Today the shower's fog will clutch at the bathroom glass, softening the reflection of our faces, while the flock's broke gasp vibrates through the windows, dampened but constant. This is an excerpt from Song to the Boreal from Magnetic North. It begins with an epigraph from Robert McFarlane. Words act as compass. Place speech serves literally to enchant the land, to sing it back into being, and to sing one's being back into it. I return home craving the forest. Too late for spruce tip tea, Branch candles gone long and waxy green. I satisfy myself with fireweed jelly, early Saskatoons, ground raspberry. Browse the canes and brambles, startling deer, white crowned sparrows. I'm looking for berries, pulp and dark juice, things that leave a mark. Svalbard has scoured me clean, beach glass at a king tide. I reek of salt 
the taste of it ground into my lips, my skin burnt by wind. How will you know me like this, soil scuffed from my palm lines? How will I know myself? I come back marveling at trees, unconvinced by dwarf birch and polar willow. Black spruce, trembling aspen, wildling crab. I pull green apples, sink my teeth for the astringency on my tongue. Wild harvest means coming home. I pluck chickweed, lamb's quarters, dandelion greens, splash vinegar to brighten, brew bush tea. I am hungry at my roots for the forest, lilt of honey on my tongue, a kind of grounding. Sing diamond willow for carving, red elder bitter with cyanide, wild gooseberry and twin flower, bog orchid, sedge, pluck burdock, plantain, styptic yarrow. Give me early afternoon under the canopy, bush tea rumbling with bees. Let me sink glassine fingers into the moss and I'll know I'm home. Mid-June and the boreal kindles like tallow. No toxins across the water. Here one players in the frontage grass and everything goes up, black spruce rickety with gum. Each summer a little longer, a little hotter, and still the quads idling out in the muskeg, stink of gas in the deep woods. Used to be fork lightning, now it's Friday night bush parties, chainsaw sparks. I come home from water and ice to a forest spitting resin like midsummer rain. We watch the news, the wind. There's not enough water in Svalbard to put this forest out if it burns. Hello, it's Joanna Lilly and I'm going to read you my last poem and it's called Off Course. And this poem is very much set in the forest that I live within, right behind me, over the fence. And it's about the Beringian wolf. Last night, in my backyard boreal forest, I thought I saw you cross the cut line, ecomorph off course, among the pines, glance past my flaccid vertical incompetence as I tripped over a spruce root. It was my high-hipped, broad-headed dog, low, lean and moving, nose to needles, dismembering squirrel mittens. You passed, not here, not quite, but millennia ago, squeezed through the Beringian Ice Age corridor between the Cordillerian and Laurentide sheets running south to the Bighorn Plains. Perhaps the bison drew you, skirting the hole that finally floored you, falling through a beam of chilling daylight to a limestone cavern, an underground pantheon of bones, garlanded now with yellow abseil ropes hoisting you to trucks and planes and east coast apparatus and brains that track your continental drift, your prey pursuing southern shift. Thank you. This next poem is an ekphrastic poem. It's based on a very beautiful art photograph by Meryl McMasters. And the uh, title of the art is Sentience. The title of the poem is Interior, A Brief History of Landscape. Feathers and twigs are here, and hands, the way the two hands, the image composed, compelling, the way they crisscross in clasp on the face of this tree in caress. This blooded, black barked, wet necked, fissured tree, captured, embraced. Human heart is here, hidden, buckled far side against the scabrous trunk. Who cares for whom? Does the tree? 
And to what are the elbows attached? What are the birds? Their rufous brown feathers and gray, brown thrasher, thrush, house sparrow or song? The soft downies of barred owls or small sharp shinned hawks? Everything is bare except feathers glued to the forearms like sleeves, adornments of twigs. Beauty too, bare, except twigs bound to the backs of fingers, taloned with small twists of haywire. A crescent of shoulder is here, but not clothes. Clothes are missing, face too. The trunk is a mask, tree mask or bark, how many disguises? How many birds die every day? The tree is tipped slightly east, slightly right. Everywhere snow and black holes for the trees drifting into the past. In truth, there is only one tree. In truth, the difference between tree and bird, between bird and two human hands, is one of degree, not kind. Her hands turn pellucid in transformation. Who here is stranded? What is strange, strangled? Who is beloved, immersed, almost lost? This is Beekeeping at the Edge of the Boreal, from Reverie, A Year of Bees. The rickety old chair in the bee yard at the height of July is the best seat on the farm. We've watched it work its magic on guest after guest, children and adults alike. People find themselves slumped on that old plastic chair when they're running from the stresses and the problems of marriage. They come looking for a tiny reprieve from their children with special needs and their elderly parents with ailing memories. Time and again, we watch the same thing happen. When the ones who need it most settle into that chair and begin to watch the apiary at work. Calm. This small bee yard at the edge of the boreal forest has its own particular kind of peace. We'll never grow the yard beyond ten hives. It's just the two of us, Thomas and I, who tend them and we want to know each hive by heart. The yard is small, the hives brightly painted in blue and purple to make them visible against the rich green shades of the aspens and saskatoons. Backed by shady resinous spruce and towering balsam poplar, the bee yard is cupped in the palm of the boreal forest. The shrubs and flowers here are those that grow in the boreal mixed wood, Labrador tea in the mossier patches and fireweed out in the open areas. Northern bedstraw, self-heal, basket willow. Crowberry shines its tiny flowers against the earth in the early spring, and dwarf cranberry grows plentifully under companion stands of tamarack and paper birch. The honey our bees produce here, and the pollen, resin, and sweet nectar they gather comes from both the market garden and the heart of the forest. Perhaps it's the breath of the forest that inspires this stillness in those who watch the hives, who come to our small off-grid farm looking for solace or escape. On the hottest days of the summer, the overhead sun draws out the scent of spruce gum, the evening breeze and counterpoint, lifting from the underbrush of the forest, wafts in the scent of birch sap from a thousand sticky leaves. When you sit in the bee yard, you are surrounded entirely by the scent of a northern summer. The white-crowned sparrows have made their grassy nests in the shelter belt behind the bee yard, taking advantage of the down limbs of the basket willow shot through with stinging nettle and fireweed. Their sound is the first you encounter when you sit in the old chair. It's a sweet song, beginning tentative and low, rising into a buzzing trill reminiscent of crickets harping in the heat of July. It's one of those sounds that stills you before you realize it, and only then, as you settle back against the warm plastic of the chair, do you become aware of the honeybees murmuring. It's a sound I perceive less as sound and more as sense when I enter the bee yard, 
My body's first response is the prickling rise of the hairs on my arms. Then I become aware of the hum from the hives, a sound I register somewhere in my sternum. A colony at the height of its power in the middle of summer is home to some 50,000 bees, and the thrum of the bee yard is the sound of ten times that number. They're droning out their pleasure at the warm summer's day, a perfect temperature to build brood and lay in their honey stores, and at the richness of the field and forests around them. Just beyond the brush pile, the first wild roses pop magenta against the dark of the spruce, and the air is heavy with pollen dust and the clove scent of the blossoms. I'll walk the shelter belt one day soon with a basket in hand, harvesting a petal or two from each rose, leaving most of the blossom behind to ensure pollination. The petals, layered in a clean jar with the remnants of last season's honey poured over top, will resurrect the full decadence of summer on our morning toast through the autumn months. Today the bee yard hums with colonies at their prime, the memory of winter privation behind them, and the long, slow days of summer ahead. Thaw back. The rental car arches us over the highway, music steaming off the dash, the controlled burned shadow rising on the left, blackened trunks felled on the hills, and birds' nest tumors sprung from the living. We simulate understanding, ears to the forest, and animals prickly hide, our eyes scanning the mustard letters on Parks Canada camouflage green a gloss that damns our misgivings. <laughs> 